Adam, you're muted. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Let me start again. That was a wonderful start. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, in the third in our series, uh, the Savings by Design webinar series. Um, our goal with these uh, webinars is to introduce everyone to some of the topics we cover in depth in the Savings by Design workshops. Uh, we have covered energy modeling and deep energy retrofits. Now, the Savings by Design workshop is not all about energy. One of the more important aspects of uh, the impacts of buildings on the environment is the impact on water. Obviously, when we put up a building, the water uh, that falls from the sky or comes through the ground or um, any other way that water gets there, it needs to go somewhere. Um, and in the past, most of this water has been either directed through pipes or stored in large concrete um, uh, basins somewhere. Um, however, there is a novel approach to this, uh, which is called low impact design or low impact development. So that's the topic of today's uh, webinar. I would like to uh, introduce Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas um, to give us a little introduction and send us on our way. Mary? Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Good afternoon and welcome to the third webinar presented by Enbridge Gas and Sustainable Buildings Canada. Um, as Adam said, my name is Mary Sai. I'm from Enbridge Gas and I'm the energy advisor for our commercial new construction program, Savings by Design. The audience today is a very broad mix of municipalities, developers, consultants, industry reps, academics, and nonprofits. Our goal is to give an overview of what constitutes a low impact development and answer questions about how to achieve it during our Savings by Design workshop. For those who of you who are not familiar with Savings by Design, it's an Enbridge program that is facilitated by Sustainable Buildings Canada which supports builders and developers to achieve 15% combined energy efficiency above current code. Some of the questions we'll be answering today include, what is the difference between gray water, storm water, and rainwater? How should the use of these non-potable water sources be prioritized? What is the current policy trends affecting stormwater management in Ontario? How long, how can low density housing industrial and commercial campuses and subdivisions best address new and upcoming regulations about stormwater? How can high density and high rise developments address new and upcoming regulations about stormwater? And as well as when is the best time in the development process to integrate how low impact development practices? Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to the team at Sustainable Buildings Canada who will be conducting today's webinar. Following the webinar, a link will be set out as to how to access the information that is presented. The webinar today will be recorded, so don't worry if there's a few things you may have missed, you'll all have a chance to review the content at a later date. Also, we'd love to hear from you as how we're doing during the live Q&A after the webinar, so please hold any questions until then. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, I can be contacted at Mary, M-A-R-Y, dot sci at embridge.com thanks again for joining for today and i'd like to introduce jenny hill who is a stormwater expert as well as an assistant dean for the university of toronto over to you thanks jenny thank you very much mary uh is my screen on show now excellent thank you so as uh, we've already heard, today's presentation is going to be on low impact development and I'll be talking both about uh, land-based practices as well as building integrated practices. Um, for your later reference, uh, here are my contact details and that's what I look like when I'm uh, in a studio with a professional photographer. Uh, this is my partner in crime, uh, a professional engineer, Sylvie Sprachman, who helped me assemble today's slide deck but won't be joining our webinar. And here are the learning outcomes as Mary has just explained them to us, again, for your later reference. So the first thing that's really changing and one of the very hot topics that's happening in stormwater management at the moment is a real shift between detention only practices uh, to also encompass retention targets and retention practices. So I'm going to begin by having a look at the regulatory framework as it pertains to Ontario, but the same is happening globally. We're seeing this real shift in the types of policies that are affecting how stormwater is managed. So 
I'm going to begin by showing you what we call some hydrographs, which, uh, as you can see, we've got a graph in the top right hand corner, and we're going to have a look at how much water is flowing in the sewer during a rainstorm event. So here's my little animation of the rain falling. Some of it you can see has soaked into the soil, but some of it has gone into the sewer where uh, some of the sediment is collected and the water passed away from that naturalized landscape. So you see that the flow rose and then it fell again in the time that, uh, that we had the rainstorm event. Well, this is a, a little bit idealized and I'm sure that you will appreciate that this is about explaining a concept rather than anything very specific. But I just want to point out a few things that we did see in that little animation. Looking now over on the left hand side, we can see that no water fell beneath the trees. Trees actually capture quite a lot of water on their surfaces, as well as the, the water that actually penetrated into the soil. Those were both key features. And in some of our uh, peri-urban areas, as we're starting to expand uh, our cities across Canada and around the world, we're paving over areas like that. And as it was, um, oh, the artist escapes me now, but, uh, but, oh, it's put up a parking lot. Anyway, let that reference go. Here we are, we've got the parking lot, and now we've got the same scenario, same sewer, and we're going to have the same rainstorm. And what happens here is that none of the water is soaking away. All of the water moves very quickly across the asphalt and we get that very rapid rise in the flow of water in the sewers. And so what engineers found throughout the 20th century as we were doing a lot of urbanized development is that we were starting to get some flood uh, situations. And this flooding was caused by that very rapid rise where you can see that there's a very high peak there and we had a lot of water flowing all at once. And so the response from civil engineers in the 20th century was to put in what we call um, a detention tank. And in the detention scenario, we've got the water comes in, it flows across the surface, and you can see that the total flow was reduced by, by that extra tank or cistern being in place. And that's what we still do. We still do it a great deal with all of our new developments. And this helps a lot with flood reduction in all of our urbanized areas, because you can see that we've really brought down that very high flow rate. However, what we haven't done is we haven't incorporated uh, the water which was landing on the trees and then evaporating away again, we haven't replaced that. And we haven't replaced the water that went into the soil. And so we're starting to move now in the 21st century towards engineering solutions, which incorporate this low impact development, which is over on the far right hand side, where we're seeing a lot more complicated water systems being uh, replicated and addressed with the types of engineering that we do. Um, and they, this water that is re, uh, retained on the trees and also soaks into the soil is all of the retention water. That's the water that never leaves the site. It doesn't go into the sewer. And so what we're trying to do now is increase, uh, using engineering methods, increase retention, the water that never goes into the sewer, as opposed to simply slowing down the water, which is what we saw with that tank system. In Ontario, the MECP, uh, about three years ago, we started to come up with some very ambitious targets for how much water, and the water here is being measured as a depth because the water falls from the sky and is measured in depth. And we can see that all of these depths are uh, across much of Ontario, an inch of water or more. And this is not water that can be put in a tank anymore and simply uh, allowed to flow to the sewer the following day. This is water that will have to stay on the site uh, and either be soaked into the soil or um, otherwise uh, managed. So the, we, we just had a look at that uh, provincial target. What, what are we seeing at the different municipalities? Well, Toronto have their green standard and we're currently up to version three. Um, and if a project wants to go for tier two, which is when you start to get these development charge rebates and um, some money back, then um, you are required to do this. You are required to retain the runoff generated from 10 millimeters. So they haven't gone quite all the way up to that provincial target. They have found something which um, 
will help developers to understand the new technologies and sort of drive people forwards with uh, innovation, but without making it very difficult to achieve all at once. So you can see they offer different options. Infiltration is going the water going into the soil. Evapotranspiration is the water that we saw coming off the trees. And they're also talking about water harvesting and reuse, which is about water that eventually goes to the sewers, but not directly. They particularly advocate for green infrastructure and uh, talk about a number of different technologies that are applicable. And they also um, give some indications as to how to go about water harvesting targets. And mostly in the city of Toronto, I know that they are very keen to see people uh, flushing toilets, but um, they also do consider irrigation schemes because irrigation is a little bit of both of these. Uh, in a few other municipalities, we're seeing a different approach where they're, so those development charge rebates are obviously for the developer, that money is, um, that incentive is coming right at the front of the project. Uh, here, in contrast, uh, these three municipalities are doing a stormwater fee system, so that is an ongoing, like, it's a, it's a, a partitioning of the tax. So that a particular part of the taxation is being uh, connected to stormwater. So they haven't added a new tax, they've just sort of sliced off a bit of tax and started to um, uh, look at stormwater management using that. And they offer rebates on an ongoing annual basis according to different targets. And you can see that their priorities are quite different. In Mississauga, they're much more focused on peak flow reduction. And in Guelph, they're much more interested in the volume reduction, total volume reduction. So let's run poll one and uh, see how people are um, keeping up with these ideas of uh, retention and detention. Uh, when we run poll one, let's see which criteria requires stormwater retention. I can't see the poll, so um, whichever of the uh, organizers are running the poll, you'll have to close it then. Okay, we're still going right now. Thank you. Let's cut it off before too long, because if people are doing something else at the same time, then they might not okay. have time to participate. There, we've closed and here are the results. So, at 50% say peak flow reduction, 83% say runoff volume reduction. That's right. So it is the runoff volume reduction. So we saw a much greater response on that one. That's, that's great. So all of the water that is retained will be reducing that volume. Um, peak flow reduction, yes, you're quite right. It does also have an impact on peak flow reduction, but peak flow reduction can also be um, managed using detention as well. So both were right, but uh, the second one was what I was thinking more about because it can only be achieved with retention. So another uh, driving factor that some developers and their teams may be interested in is if you're pursuing a uh, lead, then um, there are a number of different credits which relate to stormwater management. And if you're using a low impact uh, development approach, then actually you can get not only the rainwater management points, but often you can, um, with working with a landscape architect, um, you can also get the restore habitat points if you're using native plantings. And quite possibly you may get the heat island reduction points if you are using planting strategically to um, help cool the air around the building. And that might include a green roof or um, even some shading structures um, could arguably be uh, put forward for those points as well. So here are the different tools and I've, um, as I said at the top, I've sort of outlined um, three different sort of categories of uh, tools in our toolkit here. We've got the land-based and the building integrated. Can we run poll three, please? And here, uh, which of these technologies have uh, participants used previously? Okay, the poll is live, and we will close it uh, once we see uh, responses dropping off.
And then because I can't see the poll, could you just let us which is let us know which are the most popular couple of technologies, Adam? Yes. So uh, we oh here we can see the results. I'm not sure if you can see that screen now. So 56% have uh, experience with infiltration chambers, 63 with green roof, 56 with permeable pavers, 25% uh, with rainwater harvesting, and 50% with bioretention. Oh great! Very experienced crowd. Wonderful. So uh, these are largely land-based practices. So um, I'll go through, although we've got all those different tools to put into place, um, I would describe each of those different practices uh, or as structures or structural LID components. So we've got those different uh, sort, of, sort of tools that we were looking at. But integrating any of these tools into your site plan or into your development is going to get increasingly costly if they're bolted on towards the end of the site plan. And this is something that I have seen a lot of and I know is very common um, and has been in the last 10 years. Let's say it's definitely reducing. People are starting to incorporate these kinds of technologies much earlier in the planning phase when there's more uh, freedom to take a whole site strategy which incorporates some of these tools um, but I am still occasionally coming across projects where people um, either in response to targets from a municipality or with their own sustainability ambitions they're trying to put these tools uh, the individual bioretention cells or an individual feature into an already designed um, project or already designed site plan and it does get really costly um, and this, this turns a lot of people off because they have poor experiences with something that was costly and difficult to fit into their overall scheme. Well, unfortunately, LID is often spoken about just in terms of those structural elements. But if you actually go back and look at the literature and you uh, sort, of, sort of study this as a planning subject, you find that low impact development was always a planning discipline to begin with. And it was only later on that we came up to these individual type features. And so I would like um, everybody really to start to move towards thinking more of LID as a philosophy, uh, a site planning philosophy, more so than it is just these individual features. And it absolutely starts with what we call better site design. And uh, this is one of my slides. There's a, a lot of my slides here will have uh, references and links inside them. So if you're accessing the slides later, you'll be able to uh, make use of these references and links. And the idea is that um, the site is examined to look at all of its existing features and rather than um, bulldozing the entire site to be largely featureless and then sort of applying your own features again, uh, we actually take a more gentle approach. It can be very cost effective not to have to do a lot of recontouring and regrading of the land, but instead to use the natural drainage systems and perhaps even leave in some surface water flow as well as uh, green components on the land. So what would that look like? Here's a stepwise approach taken from the Urban Design Compendium, which describes better site design as a stepwise process. So it's, it can be done with GIS or it can be done just with a scrap of paper, like on a sketch format. Um, I've done a quick study, uh, just doing a site that is uh, somewhere here in sort of central south Ontario. Um, it's just north of Newmarket and I don't know anything about whether it's right for development, but I spotted that it was on the edge of Newmarket and I was like, hey, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of slides showing what I mean. So this is um, a parcel of land which has a variety of different land use types on, as you can see. Um, I went ahead and I had a little look at what the grades are like in that local area using um, the Ontario Flow Assessment Tool. I then um, interrogated it in terms of the watershed. So the watershed, my question is, of all of this parcel of land, where does it all drain to already naturally um, with the topography and uh, with the, the other features? So I can see now how much of the site drains to that one particular area where it's um, sort of crossing over to the more developed area. I've put an orange star there. So knowing that, I can also use uh, public provincial data sets to get an idea of the, what land use is inside sorry, what land use is inside that area, including things like hedgerows, and hedgerows are often overlooked in terms of their value as green infrastructure. And um, you may gather that I have a bit of an accent, and I come from a country with a great many hedgerows, 
and there's a, a lot of um, political awareness and ecological movement towards the preservation of hedgerows, um, which I think could be translated to a lot of these types of regions that we have um, in and around the Holland Marsh and uh, the Southern Canadian Shield, where we've got this agricultural land which is starting to be developed. So we have both marshes, we have the woodland and the hedgerows. And then the idea would be that you would uh, put in your approach perhaps from Green Lane in order to not disturb too much of uh, these ecological systems. And once you've uh, started to do your site planning, um, you will be starting to think about how big are some of these tools for managing the rainwater and for producing uh, retention benefits. And so um, I've got a few slides here that just sort of outline what these types of um, tools might look like when fitted into the landscape. They can be very naturalized and soft, or they can be quite formal in the bioretentions. These stormwater tree pits are a sort of extension of the bioretention idea where the surface can actually be paved over. And we see this a lot now in the city of Toronto and a lot of other very urbanized areas where um, stormwater management is now being performed it's sort of secretly or invisibly. It's not really an infiltration chamber, but it's somewhat related because the water is going underground in order to soak away. But it's also being used as an opportunity to grow larger, healthier trees in a very uh, otherwise dense and urban compact area where trees might suffer. And here's a site that I did a study on a couple of years ago where these two trees which are out in Etobicoke are now 10 years old and they are irrigated exclusively with water that runs off from Queensway, which is a priority um, trunk road and receives a lot of ploughing and a lot of salting. And these trees are irrigated with that water using that kind of crate system. And they are incredibly healthy and larger than a lot of the street trees in the area planted at the same time. Uh, this example is in Mississauga where they have done the same thing. These trees are Chanticleer pear and they are being irrigated directly from the catch basins. So they are managing and retaining the excess stormwater from the adjacent roadway here. A technology which um, a lot of people get excited about until they've tried it out once or twice and therefore people develop mixed feelings is permeable pavement. Um, the issue here often is about the maintenance requirements and about maintaining that permeability of the surface. And for that reason, we tend to see more people uh, these days using it on pedestrianized areas or areas that are going to be fairly low trafficked because then there'll be less sediment buildup and the surface will remain permeable and in good service for a longer time. Uh, here's a couple of examples. The one on the left is here in Toronto. That's um, quite an old type of system now, these interlocked bricks, with the little nubbins, that means that you retain a gap between each piece of interlock. Uh, that system has been in place for many years and it's in a pedestrianized area and it's in very good service. Uh, over on the right hand side, we see a technology which is not widely used in Ontario yet. Uh, it's a precast pervious concrete slab and it's something which there's a few manufacturers in the USA now and it's starting to be considered on different projects but it has quite a utilitarian feel so it's going in sometimes just around the edges of parking lots to take the excess drainage and water from a larger surface. Pervious concrete maintains its permeability much longer than the little um, bricks that use the nubbins to maintain the gaps. Um, pervious concrete tends to keep its um, permeability because the permeability is across the entire of the surface. It's not just reliant on particular little gaps and cracks. Now, permeable pavement, the water is going directly um, onto that surface and it carries whatever debris has flowed off uh, nearby surfaces as well. If you're looking at something more like a bioretention or a swale, then um, pre-treatment um, systems are recommended. And there are a large number of manufactured products now, which can be placed either in line with your other green infrastructure or LID components, or um, 
the principle is is much like this four bay. The four bay is uh, will be the four bay will be recognised by many of you who um, have indicated you've already used LID uh, components because I imagine you've worked with stormwater ponds and they often have a four bay. But as we move towards uh, smaller, more compact uh, treatment systems. We're seeing a lot of these kinds of things, which are precast uh, pre concrete components, which much have a much higher efficiency and uh, can be integrated uh, upstream of the uh, system. So uh, sometimes something like this uh, little gravel diaphragm would be sufficient for a swale or a bioretention if it was a small one in the street. But if you're talking a large bioretention serving um, a small community of houses and roadways, then perhaps something more like uh, this, this product, which is uh, um, an oil grit separator, would be more appropriate there. And speaking of swales, um, this is an example in Brampton where that water is coming off the roadway and being treated here by the soils and the vegetation, but at the same time enough room is uh, also being provided for the water to be conveyed from one end to the other. So there's an overflow at one end and the water is actually moving and draining through that system just as much as it is being treated at the same time. And this is... Um, a very popular choice now. We see a lot of people using these kinds of systems. Uh, they offer the benefit of the infiltration, hence the name, um, over using some sort of stormwater vault or chamber that just simply does detention. But they offer little else in the way of um, green infrastructure support. So I would um, advocate for these being used in com combination with other forms of green infrastructure, particularly if it's a community project. Uh, a nice example that we see quite often now is where they're being used beneath playing fields. So that naturally, um, with that normal recreational use of very flat turf grass, combines very nicely with um, the maintenance needs and the loading needs of these kinds of systems. So in municipal contexts, uh, this, this works really well to have very large infiltration galleries. Now, if you were using um, different components of LID that we've just looked at, which are small and going to be um, distributed throughout a development, um, such as by retentions in your roadways or tree pits in your roadways, we still need to manage those stormwater events. We still need to have detention as well. And what we are starting to see a little bit more of in some municipalities is to provide that extra det detention using something like um, a dry pond. And a dry pond, they fell out of favour a few decades ago because they had inferior water quality treatment compared to wet ponds. But when used in combination with other green infrastructure, which is providing that water filtering and cleansing um, function, these kinds of dry ponds might start to see a resurgence. And I know, like I say, a few municip municipalities are definitely looking that way to start to incorporate this kind of thing. So these two are in Scarborough. These ones were constructed a while ago now. And they are designed to handle the kind of storm we would only expect to see every few decades. So these uh, grassy areas, which are grassy depressions, which can be used sometimes. Uh, one of the, these is a baseball diamond. The other one is simply a, an open grassy area for recreation. They're, you know, they just sit there being dry. They're just sort of sloped topography. But when we have those big storm events, then the water can flow into these from um, one of these. Uh, um, uh, sewer inlets and outlets. So before I move on to talk about some building integrated practices, do we have any questions from any of the uh, audience participants today about these uh, types of LID systems which are on the land? Feel free um, to put up your hand. You should have that option, or um, if you type in a question, uh, we can open up the uh, the mic for you so you can ask Jen directly. Okay, well, well, we'll see if there are questions towards the end. Well, building integrated practices are um, a big, uh, big subject for me. I'm very interested in building integrated practices. 
because I live and work in an area that is very urbanized and it's often not possible to use some of these land-based practices. <clears throat> and so I've done a lot of work with people who are struggling because they don't have any significant landscape at grade. And the first technology I'm going to talk about is one that everybody in this area is very familiar with, which is green roofs. Um, and the green roofs function uh, for stormwater management in two different ways. So one is that during a rainstorm event, the plants get wet, the soil gets wet, and then only the excess flows off. Um, and in the research that I did at the University of Toronto, which is where I wrote my PhD, we found that uh, up to about 10 millimetres of rain, so coming back to this idea of water as depth, about 10 millimetres could be retained by a dry green roof. Um, but that number goes down if your green roof is already wet, you know, if it rained the day before, or indeed if you've irrigated it. A lot of green roofs are irrigated. Which brings me to the second function, which is people irrigate their green roofs. So here we have a bright, shiny, sunny day, and here the irrigation has been used to wet the leaves and also to wet the soil, and we get that evapotranspiration happening, taking the water up off the building and away into the atmosphere, which is very desirable from a, an ecological and hydrological perspective. So irrigation is not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on whether your ambition with your green roof is to capture water on the day it rains or whether it is to uh, evaporate water in the subsequent days. Uh, the most lightweight and easy green roof, which our research found to actually do these two objectives was to have a four inch or 100 millimeter planting material, which um, the better material we found was to be organic based. So uh, a high degree of wood compost in that planting material uh, combined with a sedum mat. So that would look a little bit like this uh, as it matured. So this was one of the, our experimental uh, units. And um, I've also visited a very large number of other green roofs and uh, so here's just some examples of the diversity of green roofs that can be achieved with that very shallow profile. So every one of these roofs is what we call an extensive green roof and only uh, four to six inches deep. Uh, all taken from a variety of different rooftops in and around the GTA. So because uh, there's a lot of ambition to, um, or aspiration and um, incentive, let's say, to use green roofs to manage stormwater, we see um, some partner products starting to come to market, which I have described as absorbent surfaces. So here's just two examples of these absorbent surfaces, both of which are really marketed for being alongside a green roof. So that might be um, up on the top of a tower, it might be uh, on an amenity space or a podium deck. Um, the one on the left is a, a ceramic product. Um, it comes in lots of different finishes. It's a very high-end product. And it differs from the permeable paving which we saw earlier in that the manufacturer has characterized exactly how much water will stay inside the system. So the individual bricks, although they're absolutely hard, to walk on, they're, you know, they're ceramic, they're very, very hard, they will actually retain the water directly inside. So they can retain six millimeters of water. And um, so they're, they're going to retain a similar amount of water to a green roof. Um, I haven't seen any examples of people spraying water back onto them in order to uh, evaporate the water away. But in terms of that first, during the storm event, they, they do offer um, some solution to help with retention there. The product on the right hand side, um, the clever bit is uh, the blue composite material. And this is actually um, a soft wadding type material. So it is not designed as a walkable surface. It's designed more for the edges and perimeters of different systems or for inaccessible roof decks where a green roof is not mandated or not desired for some reason, but
but there is still um, the need to capture excess storm water. So uh, that's, that's a very different type of application. Although I realize that the photograph of each, they look fairly similar. And so this type of thing also brings me onto the subject of blue roofs. And for a long time, um, going back to, I'd say early 21st century engineering, we had the idea of rooftop detention. And the, so the idea there, as we, as we heard at the top of the presentation, detention is simply slowing the water down. It's not about the water going somewhere else into the uh, environment. It's about just slowing the rate of water. The blue roofs, in the last few years, people are starting to come up with different technologies and ideas where the water is slowed down so much that you might get significant evaporation off the surface. And in the summertime, locally, we could get uh, seven or eight millimeters of water. If you actually put out a bowl of water outside, you might lose seven or, uh, you know, between seven and eight millimeters, possibly, on a very hot day at the height of summer. So um, the system that I'm showing on the right hand side was a pilot being run in New York City where the individual uh, trays are holding ballast and then excess rainwater. And the, the study there was to see if they could uh, protect the rooftop membrane because you see there is little extra standing water on that membrane, it's all just in the trays. Uh, and also to see what the overall reduction in water runoff was. So this is just one idea. Um, other ideas that I've seen include having um, small like check dams, like little dams all the way across the roof to slow down the water so significantly. And um, locally, um, we're starting to see um, some other products coming to market which are sort of hybridizing some of these ideas. So this is just a reference point for you about um, the drain downtime. So, you see that the OBC here starts to come into play because if you're going to have water on the actual rooftop membrane, then it has to drain off within 24 hours. And that's why we start to see some sort of interesting systems that might be keeping the water off the roof rather than being directly on the roof. But um, there's a lot of incentive locally to work with green roofs. And so we have Mark, uh, some products a little bit like this. Um, where we've got over here on the right hand side, you can see that there is actually a hybridized model here where we've got a green roof that has been built on top of small crates, uh, which are actually holding free water. Like uh, that water isn't soaked into the growing media, that's like wet, uh, you know, flowing water. And they even do it underneath um, pa pavement surfaces there as well. So it could, you could have a rooftop deck, where you would have water underneath the whole surface. The disadvantage in terms of hydrologic function of this kind of thing is that if you store all of your water, as we see on the left here, underneath the pavers, it is not going to be nearly so warm and it certainly isn't receiving the same level of radiation directly from the sun. It isn't subject to wind either. And if that water doesn't receive wind and it doesn't receive sunshine, it's not going to evaporate. So you can store the water on your roof, but then this water would have to have another purpose. This is more like having a cistern for rainwater harvesting, where that water is then going to go on, perhaps further down the building, under gravity, it's going to uh, serve some other reuse purpose. This uh, particular system has been designed to put little legs underneath the green roof, more so to protect the green roof from flooding and inundation, because as you see in the um, CAD drawing here, we're still using a controlled flow drain. So in this combination, we're getting both retention, which is going to be in that green roof module, and we're also going to have detention during high flow events as well. So um, another really interesting option to consider if you're working with a green roof would be to have something like that, the combination. Now, green walls and green facades, I'm going to say just a few words on this. Um, they have been, they're not being hailed as massive successes globally. Uh, and that's even in more temperate climates than we have here. Uh, 
The one on the left is in Milan and it is a very high-end development and they have a crew who abseil down the outside of the building all the time, uh, maintaining those trees and plants. Very, very high energy, high maintenance type system, comes with a cost. The system on the right hand side is in China and uh, there they had problems with overgrowth because they didn't have the same kind of maintenance uh, planning and they've had a lot of uh, residents actually unable to move into or occupy those buildings because they also had a large insect in infestation. So it became very overgrown. These kinds of systems are really quite high maintenance and they also add um, uh, massive structural um, loading uh, issues for the building. So the building has to be built with so much more capacity to hold all of these cantilevered structures with all of this mass of not only the timber of the trees themselves, but also the, you know, the soil and then the extra water as a live load. And so um, when I've also seen some studies recently where they've looked at the energy balance <clears throat> and they've argued that the, the buildings have to be reinforced to such a degree that they're using so many more materials that this is offsetting any possible um, sustainability outcome from having that vegetation which is unfortunate and I, I appreciate the fact that people are experimenting and trying these things. What is similar and very much I am a fan of is green facades. So um, they may either be directly upon the building. These ones are, in, these uh, illustrations are of plants that are being permitted to climb on the building, but much more uh, popular and I think would be much more easy to maintain would be these indirect green facades where some sort of screen or cabling system is being used to support the vegetation. That way, if you use a deciduous vegetation, like uh, locally we have things like uh, hops would do it, grapes would do it, uh, Virginia creeper would do it, we get uh, the sunshine, um, we get the shading effect in the summer, and then we're going to uh, have full sun in the winter so we can get the best of both worlds. And the aesthetic might be something like this much lighter weight whilst also getting that green greenery benefits. The individual planters themselves where the plants are, are placed can also provide significant stormwater management benefits by retaining extra water. And now I'm going to hop on to what I think, if I just check, is going to be uh, my final subject which is about um, rainwater uh, harvesting. So uh, the rainwater uh, under the Ontario Building Code, we have a definition of what is rainwater and what is stormwater. So rainwater is storm sewage, they call it, runoff that is collected from a roof or the ground, but not accessible patios and driveways. Um, so for example, if we had an amenity deck on a podium roof that was draining down to the basement, then that water could not be used for a uh, like the hose bibs, for example, um, or any of these more uh, sensitive uses uh, like laundry, because that would then be classed as stormwater because it's been an accessible area. And so that's something to think about if you're working with a rainwater harvesting system. The other thing to note is uh, on top of the Ontario Building Code, we also have the Canadian Standards. And this is quite a helpful guide, this B805. Um, helps people really see what is a viable use of their water and what isn't. So again, we've got this division into rainwater and stormwater. And we can see that for uh, subsurface irrigation, which is very popular, there's no recommendation to particularly clean that water up with regard to pathogens. As soon as you go for toilet and urinal flushing, um, particularly if it's just uh, rainwater, you can see that uh, there's a requirement to remove 99% of some of these pathogens. And what I want you to bear in mind is that every time we add another nine to these figures, we might be looking at like a tenfold increase in price. We're certainly looking at an exponential requirement, which is going to get very expensive very quickly. So let, let us look then at something like toilet flushing. If we do it with rooftop water, that might be achievable. You know, we've got this sort of 99 target. But as soon as we add some of that podium water, which is storm water, suddenly we've got 99.99. The demand has shot up and we're looking at um, 
quite sophisticated technology now to remove all of the viruses and all of the bacteria to that level. That might include filtering, uh, UV treatment, additional chemical treatment, um, and bear in mind that uh, a maintenance person, somebody who's at the building periodically checking on the system to make sure that it's performing. And this is the reason that uh, we find that most people are interested in something like either subsurface irrigation or toilet flushing using rainwater. Because as soon as we start going into spray irrigation, again, we see it gets very expensive very quickly, uh, hose bibs. But what we are starting to see, which is exciting, is uh, we see commercial vehicle washing um, starting to become popular, particularly with municipalities who might be running a large fleet of vehicles. They might have uh, vehicle washing at their um, warehouse, um, not warehouse, the, the sheds where they're keeping the vehicles. So they're able to harvest a lot of water and then use it to wash down their, bus their buses or their uh, streetcars, for example. And this little illustration is about how if you were, have a single building and you're collecting both rainwater off of, off of your roof, as well as stormwater off the ground, there's a real sort of, uh, it can get quite complex in terms of understanding what it is you can do with these different uh, water types. And one thing that uh, people are often concerned about is that water that's come from a green roof will have uh, some additional yellow color which has been soaked out of the compost material on the green roof. So that additional yellow color can be off-putting if what they intend to do is flush toilets. But I look forward to a future where people don't expect to be able to drink from the toilet. So actually uh, reused water might become more and more acceptable as more people are using uh, rooftop water. We will get used to the idea that perhaps that water is discolored and it doesn't have to be the same as, as would come from our Brita jug. So uh, now I'm going to sort of, we can see the parking lot here. The parking lot now has a, like a little bioretention strip. And we're starting to get to a time now where we've got both the tank underneath the ground still, and we've managed to soak some water into the soil using our little green vegetation strip. And we've managed to reduce that flooding using the tank as well. And this is the, the future is to use a combined approach with uh, different technologies planned from early on. And uh, um, yeah, and achieve both targets all at once. So I would like to uh, invite part of, um, all of the audience if they want to ask any questions. Then now is a time again because uh, I have nothing further to present, and we only have a few minutes. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, already in the uh, the slot here. If anyone else has any questions, uh, you can again you can raise your hand or Type it into the question box and we will ask Jen for you. So first, uh, a question from Keith Jameson. Are permeable slabs subject to freeze and thaw damages? Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I know that the ceramic slabs that I showed you uh, later on that do retain water. They have laboratory testing uh, certificates for having undergone rapid freeze-thaw cycling to demonstrate that they don't spall or blow apart. And I believe that the same is true for the large concrete type slabs as well. So when I said that I know that they're being produced in the US, it's largely in the, I think there's two different main manufacturers and they're both in the Northeast. So they're both in freezing climates as well. And so um, I would expect that they have undergone those kinds of rigors, both in the laboratory and in pilot studies. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, and we have another question. Uh from Lou Fawn, a former student of yours, she says, um, oh, yeah. with uh, Dr. Jennifer Drakes. Um, so she asks, uh, oftentimes LID and landscaped areas take away a lot of profitable space on a development project. As a civil engineer, what are ways that we can incentivize the use of LIDs for our clients on their development projects? Um, so, yeah, I hear what you're saying about there being a limited amount of developable land. Um, some of the projects that I have seen performed um, on subdivisions where they've decided to pursue an LID approach, they've actually been able to reclaim land. Um, I'm thinking there's one over in Witchwood, which where they did that. Um, areas 
the areas that are best designated for LIDs are ideally those where there was going to be some sort of landscape or streetscape feature to begin with. Um, and then it comes about integrating that across the street, streetscape cross section. Um, so that's where we see people using uh, skinny little bioretentions or swales. Uh, I, we also see people using uh, infiltration pipe systems, which can be put in underneath the road, are starting to become very popular on different subdivisions. So they take up no extra space at all. Um, I've also seen people putting infiltration chambers, as I say, underneath parks. So if the um, subdivision or the development is going to include some sort of play area, or um, a decorative garden feature, then the sometimes uh, chambers can be installed underneath those so that the space can be reclaimed. So rather than having a stormwater pond, they might have quite a lot of chamber systems where they're going to get some infiltration benefit and some detention benefit. And I think that's why those kinds of chambers are very popular, is because you, you're tackling both problems at once. Um, I haven't come across them actually costing space because that space is usually taken out of um, what would have been public space already. What I do hear more concerns about is I've come across a lot more people concerned about if an LID um, system such as a trench is going to run across the back of uh, a series of lots or uh, housing sites, then how will the maintenance crew get there in the future? So that kind of thing, if the land is graded so that the houses are going to be at the front and the LID is going to be in their back garden or at the end of their backyard, how will the crew get to it to maintain it in the future? And th that question still remains to be answered on a municipal, uh, on a different municipality basis. Some of them are going to seek easements. Some are, uh, some municipalities are electing not to get involved at all. Others are starting to, yeah, reframe the way that they work with private landowners. That's, uh, yeah, good question. Thank you. Okay, we have a, another question from Matthew Day. Um, is there LID integration with smart city design? Um, an example um, is the Canadian Society of Civil Engineers just last week or earlier this week, they just ran a webinar on smart blue rooms. And what they were really looking at there is they were looking at uh, rooftop detention systems that were smart controlled. So the water would be, remain upon the roof until another rainstorm was expected, at which time the water that was remaining after evaporation had taken place, that remaining water would then be discharged. Hopefully that would be a much lower volume than had originally fallen. And then the rooftop is now dry to, to take the next rainstorm event. So that's something that is being investigated as a form of blue roof. Um, I know that Collingwood, as a, as a municipality, are using those kinds of smart systems on um, residential and small community rainwater barrels as well. So they are using an approach where they're working uh, with lots of different um, individual landowners where they're experimenting using smart systems that do the same thing. They will discharge the uh, water just before a rainstorm event. So they're using predictive technologies. Uh, we also see um, there's some research going on doing that with green roofs as well. Not so locally, but I've heard of um, systems where, again, they anticipate rainstorms in advance and then they turn off the irrigation system so that it won't irrigate for a day or two in advance of a significant rainstorm event. And that's very helpful if your green roof uh, target is to just be used as a, a sponge to take up storm water, then having your irrigation uh, smart definitely will help. Okay, we have another question that sort of follows on from this one, I think, um, from uh, Raleigh Oriel. What kind of LIDs can be implemented in a multi-use development that has underground structures encompassing 90 to 100 percent of the property? Um, in that case, you're looking largely at those building integrated systems that are going to keep the water up on the building in some way. So that was where the green roofs with blue roofs come into play. That's why people are using these kinds of systems that retain water uh, elsewhere. Uh, green roofs and blue roofs, we've got the um, also the stormwater planters combined with the green facade 
So if the water then is permitted to tear down the side of the building, it can be actually retained in uh, small stormwater planters that could uh, support the, the growth of green facades. The other uh, solution is if you've got underground structures, quite often that will encompass a stormwater vault, which is uh, the sort of high density equivalent of a stormwater pond. The, uh, it, when it's inside a building, it's more often just a vault or a, a concrete chamber. And some, sometimes they can be partitioned fairly easily so that one uh, section of it is used to keep the cleaner water that's just come from the roof. And then that can be easily used to flush toilets is, is becoming very popular now, particularly in Toronto with the green standard. Thank you and for that answer. Yeah. Toilet flushing isn't really an LID, but it's, it's definitely helping with the energy uh, expenditure associated with clean water. Okay, um, and Raleigh says thanks. Um, okay, I think that uh, is all of our questions and just conveniently runs us right up to the edge of our closing time. So well, thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you, Jen, on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada and Enbridge. Thank you for your time and making um, all of this information available to us all. Um, I, I, I'll, on behalf of all of the audience as well, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, the a recording of this uh, webinar will be made available to everyone who's registered. Um, and hopefully uh, we will see more from Jen in the future. Thank you so much and goodbye, everyone.